So what are those top 10 basic skills? What do they consist of? Well, I hope some of you recognize some of these procedures. First of all, an osteopathic structural examination, standing and seated, would be a logical place to begin. Soft tissue myofascial release techniques, indirect techniques that would include the balanced ligamentous tension that would have application in all regions, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacrum. Diaphragm release, thoracic inlet, and the thoracic respiratory diaphragm. A thoracal lumbar junction inhibition technique. Occipital atlantal release and decompression, venous sinus release, sacroiliac release, Strain counterstrain techniques that could be applied to all regions and extremities. And then, last but not least, is the lymphatic pump approach using pedal pump, rib raising, or thoracic lymphatic pump as well. What do you notice in this top 10 list? I'm sorry? No HVLA. So we'll punctuate that we've chosen it for its safety, its simplicity, its consistency, but also that it has without the emotional charge that seems to accompany procedures like HVLA, especially in the cervical region. <clears throat> so we're going to have an opportunity in this workshop then to have the, you share with this experience we're going to do a little bit of a demonstration, and then we're going to have you break out to the tables. I'm going to, though, before we go to the demo, just tell you what they each one look like so you have a refresher before you, and perhaps um, this will help when you're doing your practice. First of all, when we talk about a standing postural examination, we're looking at landmarks. We want to know if there is any asymmetry, unlevelness. We want to look at the compensatory lateral curves, and we want to look at an AP as well as the lateral. And these would be your hand positions for standing postural examination. For the seated flexion test, we want to take a look at the location, first of all, for the PSIS, the posterior superior iliac spine, and then its motion characteristics with flexion. We'll have audience participation at that point. Now, where are we going from there? Well, we're going to have you do a soft tissue approach, and we're going to have Dr. King demonstrate this. And what I've done is I've listed for you in this next few slides how we would actually educate the preceptors to some of the indications so that we have a little bit more expansive list on the reasons that you would want to use this approach. And then we have some relative contraindications, or sometimes cautions, or even absolute contraindications. And so we kind of try to have that also as part of the education. I'm not going to go in detail, but I'm just having it as part of the approach so you would know what would be included in the education. And then we have a specific description of how it's done. And then what would be some of the appropriate reasons clinical presentations that you would want to use this. And then additionally you have now the third basic skill and its clinical presentations. I have it listed the indications and contraindications. That's in the bigger package. The fourth is this thoracic inlet release, specific clinical presentations that would be appropriate for it. We'll have Dr. Kirsch demonstrate that for us. Thoracal lumbar inhibition and its clinical presentations. Occipital atlantal release with clinical presentations. Venous sinus release and so forth. Sacral rocking. some counterstrain. We've chosen some selected points for the video educational piece, but as you probably all know, how counterstrain is very applicable in many, many regions. And then finally, the lymphatic techniques, so would it be the pedal pump, the rib raising, 
as well as the uh, thoracic lymphatic pump. So at this point, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is to go back up to our demonstration. And are there any thoughts or questions that have come and surfaced during this first part? Yes. Well, um, I think that's a complicated issue on, you know, what the implications are in terms of COCA's uh, viewpoint. I think we have Conrad, you know, that could probably address that, but I don't know that we could go into that detail in this particular presentation. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, you could probably mention, you know, your viewpoint. Thank you. Uh, I think that this were the sole component of our OMN clinical activity in MS3 and 4, it might be of concern. However, we too have some mandatory rotations and a mandatory osteopathic curriculum, which has not been described, but requires student involvement throughout the third and fourth year with respect to continued development of their OMN skills. The concern that we have is that we have 2,060 adjunct faculty and preceptors who uh, could have our students. Based on the numbers, that means that we will have, what, 79 or 80% of those, maybe 85% perhaps, who are allopathic physicians. Our concern was to not have degradation of skills where opportunity to exercise osteopathic assessment was present as part of a broader curriculum which requires more in-depth activities that are supervised by qualified and trained osteopathic physicians. So this is a piece of the whole, not the whole. I think what we'll do is we'll wait for further questions if I can now move on to the demo part and then we'll have opportunity to have a little bit more discussion. So, what I would like first is a volunteer for a safe, simple, okay, please come. Now, this is going to be the first top ten basic skill. How do you do? Good, how are you? I'm Dr. Heath. Tell me your name. Dosi. Okay, very nice to meet you. So, would I be um, able to touch your back? Okay. Uh, please have you stand in this way with your back toward the audience. Now, <clears throat> even with the clothing, what I'm going to do is have the landmarks identified. And you're going to be able to do this on your own when you're doing this participation. And what you'll do is you'll come in on those iliac crests. So you first will come in and get the waistline and then get on top of this iliac crest bony landmark, okay? That's your iliac crest height. Then you're gonna come up to the inferior angle of the scapula, and you're going to assess the asymmetry, high or low, right to left. And what do you see here? What's your observation? She's high on the right, okay? Now what we wanna do is educate, first of all, the, N the MD, but certainly the DO to refresh them that there's, first of all, asymmetry that's important to us. It's not immaterial. That's an education to them. 
So part of our demonstration of these basic skills is a way for them to understand better what we're doing anyway and how important it is for us to know some of these asymmetries that seem at first glance immaterial and dismissed but important to us. So as we come up now to the shoulder, we have an elevation on the right and then we can come into the mastoid, we see an elevation on the right and we begin to now understand that there may be asymmetries and there may be compensations and there may be weight-bearing differences that actually may accompany some of her challenge in her health status and perhaps even in symptoms, okay? So that's your structural examination. It's as simple as that. If they have an idea how simple it is, then perhaps, first of all, the efficiency can be done. It's not intimidating. But when the students can incorporate it into their physical examination and document it, then we begin to have now the body of evidence that is necessary for us to now move forward with clinical application. All right, now we can also take a look sideways. We can look at AP curves. We can look at expected curves. We can look at the expected thoracic kyphosis, which is flattened. We can look at the lumbar expected lordosis, which is flattened. And we begin to see that if she has an impact from the ground up, that it may actually locate or localize problems right here in the neck. Now, I didn't ask your symptoms. Low back pain. Low back pain. Well, we could, we could understand that now, couldn't we? All right, now if I look for the PSIS, and I have, genes are not the best, but mm -hmm. if I find that PSIS and then I have you bend forward and then come on back, first of all, how many of you, and I should have it go this way, PSIS, uh, bend forward but don't smack your head, okay? And what do you see? Do it one more time so I'm not in the way. One more time, okay? What do you see? Where does it rise? Did anybody see? Oh, right side, but you already kind of knew that. You already knew that. You already knew with this unlevelness, high on the right, that the chances of it riding high on the PSIS flexion test is going to be pretty good, and you're just confirming it. But what it tells you is it gives you a whole diagnosis on an axis of rotation of that sacrum. Now you begin to understand further, where's your back pain? On the right. Okay, I believe that. I believe that. I have findings, and she has a complaint. That's a good diagnosis. I like that. 